already know, this event is organized in four sessions. Today on Friday uh, and tomorrow on Saturday, we have one session at 4 p.m. and one at 7 p.m. This is our second session. For today, we just had a very important conversation with uh, Jelena Savic, Daniela Mestorovic, Ivana Pražić, and Esther Sokac about peripheral self-solidarity, drunken whites, independent infrastructure, and theorizing from practice. All sessions will be recorded and they will be available on Kuda.org YouTube channel. So if you cannot attend to any of this, don't worry, everything will be recorded. This is the most frequently asked question. Uh, for those uh, of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Anna Vilenica. I'm a freelance researcher and journalist. Um, uh, I have been active in feminist urban housing struggles in Serbia. Uh, for more than two decades now. Uh, I'm an editor of uh, two journals dedicated to radical open source publishing. One is called the Radical Housing Journal and the other one is called Interface, journal for and about social movements. Um, they both focus on anti-capitalist struggles. Uh, and in this project, I'm wearing a hat of the editor of the lexicon and moderator of these events. Uh, so the idea for this event emerged from the necessity to confront the new colonial mainstream, but also activist, artistic and cultural politics and practices that we have been encountering in our work. Uh, it also emerged from my work uh, with, uh, uh, within the project uh, uh, called Art Organization that uh, I have been working on with Hood.org uh, for two years now. Uh, and you can learn more about this project at Hood.org webpage, uh, where you can read the publication we did last year and watch recordings of previous webinars entitled Vectors of Collective Imagination in Art. Uh, so there have been many recent events and publications about colonialism, neocolonialism, anti-colonialism, and so to say horizontal decoloniality in Eastern Europe. Um, these conversations uh, demonstrated, among other things, the difficulties in translating terminology made available by post-colonial studies of European emperors to local contexts, making apparent the necessity of inventing new concepts that speak to local situation. The, term, the terms of the debate have been created and recreated, demonstrating how inventing terms of debate is not an easy task, uh, especially relates to uh, translating these terms to many languages that we are using in the, locally in East Europe. So this lexicon in progress aspires to derive meaning from referring to local East European experiences and creating from them an index of references that can assist in future criticisms, debates and practices. To get this process underway, we have invited 16 contributors uh, taking an active part in these discussions uh, and in, in practicing the coloniality. They have suggested 16 notions they found constructive in this conversation. So this lexicon is not by any means uh, like set in stone thing. Uh, it's just a list of concepts and, uh, you know, like one of the definitions that are uh, open for critical examination. These notions uh, concern broader conceptual issues related to struggles, issues related to art organizing, uh, and uh, as I said, broader conceptual stuff. Uh, so before um, I introduce our speakers, I would like to thank, thank uh, Kudorg from NYSAD for trusting this idea and for making this adventure possible for all of us. Um, today in our second session, you will hear from four amazing speakers that I will now introduce to you in order of appearance. Uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, uh, like my very dear friend and comrade, Živka Valjevičarska, um, that I met many years ago in Belgrade. So it, it has to be like ages ago because I was still doing curatorial work that I don't do for like ages. Um, and uh, I'm so happy to, to have you here, Živka, and thank you for saying yes. Uh, so Živka is Associate Professor of Political and Social Theory at Pratt Institute in New York. She works on the history of the socialist and post-socialist period in Bulgaria and the Balkans, exploring links between political ideas, social movements and culture and the arts. She is the author of the book, Restless History, Political Imaginaries and Their Discontents in Post-Stalinist Bulgaria. And she will present uh, the notion of restless history that she has been working around in her, uh, in her recent book. <clears throat> So the second speaker is uh, uh, 
Peter the Jeppy. Uh, Piero, I uh, met recently uh, uh, virtually. We had like a, an email exchange uh, and we figured that we would like to continue uh, working on the, the translations on, on some of the seminal texts uh, that relate to the, col the colonial theory. And I really hope that, uh, you know, others will join the, and that we will make this uh, idea into, into practice. So um, Piero holds a PhD in polit politics from the University of Strachlide. If I misspelled this, I'm sorry. <laughs> His research focuses on decoloniality, sexuality, and Islam. His recent work on racism and, broader, and borders along the Balkan refugee route has been published in a range of mediums in and out of academia, including the International Journal of Postcolonial Studies, Ethnic and Racial Studies, Critical Muslims, and The Guardian, among others. <clears throat> now, Anna Sladojevic, uh, um, uh, I have to say that uh, 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 this idea for the seminar also, also partly drew from something that Anna shared with me, we are uh, colleagues from uh, ICA, uh, this is Association of, uh, of Critiques, the International Association, uh, and when she saw one text that uh, I wrote with Ivana Brajic that was speaking on the previous panel, she shared uh, uh, an issue of uh, a journal where she did uh, an interview with Catherine Baker. I think it was called Race in Yugoslav Region. And uh, in this interview, I really, then it was like completely clear to me that this is the issue of terminology and that we really need uh, this kind of uh, approach like the, where we will focus terminology. So thank you, Anna, for sharing this with me. Uh, Anna is independent curator and art and media theorist. She studied museums as a complex objects whose previous discourses often inscribed within different unrecognized or invisible elements, such as circles of museum production in form of, of archives, documentation, or uh, study material bear influence on how a meaning is formed. She researched these questions particularly within the context of the Museum of African Art the Veda and Dr. Zdravko Pčela Petr collection and the Museum of Yugoslavia uh, with emphasis of certain aspects of these institutions that are related to historical non-alignment. And uh, our fourth speaker uh, is my dear friend and comrade Emina Buzinkic uh, that uh, um, yeah, I, I met uh, recently in 2017, 19, 19. Um, Yes, uh, and uh, uh, we, we have like a common point of uh, interest and this is thinking around uh, um, uh, something that is called Trans-Balkan Tribunal of Justice, uh, that is initiative in, in becoming, uh, let's say, and maybe Emina will be able to tell us a bit more about that later. Emina is a political activist uh, who shapes her work at the intersection of migration, education, transnational feminism and solidarity. She is a PhD candidate in the University of Minnesota, USA, and a member of Collective Trans-Balkan Solidarity, Initiative for Trans-Balkan Tribunal for Justice, Agitate, Unsettling Knowledges, and Imagining Transnational Solidarities Research Circle. Uh, her recent research, Endeavor with refugee, refugee Youth from the Middle East Living and Being Schooled in Croatia, expanded her ocular for decolonial feminism and epistemic justice. So I would like now to uh, ask uh, our guests and presenters uh, to uh, present uh, these notions uh, in like a 15 minutes uh, frame and then we can have like a common discussion. Uh, we introduced this format uh, like on the previous session and I quite like it uh, because this is something that we often don't do. We just take the questions from the audience and I would like to have like a, a, a section within the Q&A where you know participants can ask questions to each other and have like a small uh, debate. So Zivka, the, the floor is yours. I will stop sharing my screen now to allow you to share yours. Thank you Anna. Does this work? Thank you so much, and, and you can hear me as well. Uh, it's really amazing to see you and to know that everyone and so many people are here. And, and it was really, it's really been an honor to be part of this. And 
And Anna, thank you for continuing the conversations that have been started a long time ago. And, and, and it's really great to have these kind of um, decentralized and, and horizontal and uh, spaces in which we continue uh, to kind of think about uh, these issues. And, and also uh, um, when Anna mentioned about like how like, that we met each other a long time ago, and, and it was really kind of made me think about what a journey it's been since then and, and that we both have been kind of traversing these different contexts and, and continents and, and uh, also different kinds of work like research and historical work and activist work and being involved in a lot of struggles at the same time, culture and the arts. And, and here um, I'm, um, you know, when Anna uh, told me about the, um, the, the project and, and the, I thought about lexicon, the lexicon of decoloniality and, and the notion or the concept that uh, we want to submit. And I uh, offered and, and I am offering the concept restless history. Uh, and it is not really a concept or uh, a category and not, not a method or uh, it's, it's really a notion and a, and a um, 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 use that word and I really like it. It's a, it's a notion and, 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 and a way in, in, and I'm offering it as a way in which we can think about the history of socialism uh, in the current moment, which is kind of what I've been dealing with uh, in, in my book. And, and, and so today the socialist past uh, kind of continuously researches and, and reemerges in uh, unruly ways uh, against forces that try to simplify and stigmatize and, and erase and destroy it. And it has a rich and powerful historical content, uh, which offers um, uh, disobedient material and a source of energy uh, to draw from in the face of the unrelenting uh, right wing and neo fascist and racist uh, and patriarchal forces. Uh, in the East European region in, in the post-socialist years, and in particular in Bulgaria. And so uh, in this sense, uh, socialism is a history uh, that is both uh, subject to colonization and erasure, and also a source of uh, resistance to, uh, to, to it. It contains uh, kind of this active uh, political agency that we can draw from. Uh, and draw inspiration and, and, and power from. And so I want to make um, maybe two or three points um, uh, here uh, with respect to all of this and, and I'll develop them very briefly. So the first one is uh, about the socialist past in the Western imagination and how we need to um, decolonize the socialist past from uh, these Western imaginaries. Um, because in the West, um, the entire East European region, as it overlaps with the former socialist world, uh, is often absent from the global histories of radical and progressive politics uh, and movements. And, and this absence is the effect of the continuous dismissal of the socialist countries uh, as they were proclaimed as failures by uh, the Western liberals as well as by the Western left. Uh, even in their most um, uh, kind of radical formulations, uh, the left in Western Europe and the United States uh, has dismissed from afar the socialist societies and, and, and the socialist governments as totalitarian and authoritarian, uh, corroborating uh, Western mainstream liberal and right-wing arguments about uh, the socialist uh, countries. Yet most liberals and leftists in the West who considered these countries a failure and never set foot in them and never experienced them directly. Uh, and speaking none of their languages, most of them never attempted independent historical or ethnographic research. Uh, to receive information, they relied on dissident uh, Soviet and East European voices, which were pro-Western, anti-communist, and openly pro-capitalist, and who proclaimed them as totalitarian and authoritarian monsters. In other words, the Western left, um, never took the social realities of socialism on its own terms. Their imaginaries converge with colonial and orientalist phobias towards the East, uh, uh, seen as this vast and vaguely uh, defined region uh, and, and a place uh, with backward dictatorial uh, top-down governments uh, populated with people who cannot govern themselves and therefore needing authoritarian regimes and, and so on. And so even uh, post and decolonial critiques of the global dynamics from the 18, uh, from the 1980s onwards, uh, which have recentered the formerly colonized countries and the global south have uh, mostly neglected the role of the socialist countries in the anti-colonial liberation movements and in forging global worlds resistant to Western 
power and hegemony, focused mo mostly on first world, third world geopolitical dynamics, post-colonial critiques from the 80s and the 90s barely mentioned the socialist countries, rendering invisible the geographies of the second world and subsuming them under the frameworks of Western modernity. Much of this disavowal is due to the rigid binaries pervading their understanding of the global political context, including analysis focusing on East-West, North-South, West-South, and even South-to-South global mobilities and encounters. A recent body of work has returned to these histories to challenge uh, existing narratives, and I'm so uh, happy to see um, uh, many, many uh, of you and us here who have been part of the uh, part of this uh, of these conversations. And so studying the relations between the second and the third worlds from the mid 50s to the end of the 80s, we have begun the collective effort of rethinking the political dynamics between the socialist world and the formerly colonized countries against dominant Cold War tropes and binaries. This work has opened yet wider horizons for uh, historical uh, rethinking away from Eurocentric uh, historiographies of the uh, era. Thus displacing east-west and north-south axes of analysis, we begin to see the alternative routes and locations where decolonial politics with anti-capitalist visions emerged and thrived during the socialist era. Calling attention to the erasure of the socialist countries in a range of critical knowledge formations, my colleague Nikolai Karkov and I have proposed alternative ways of thinking about the geopolitical and historical legacy of 20th century socialism in Eastern Europe and beyond. The state socialist projects we submit echoing and building on uh, the work of other um, um, many uh, other colleagues and friends and activists and researchers um, these uh, projects should be acknowledged as a front of resistance to capitalism and as a force of disobedience and insubordination uh, in the face of Western colonial projects. They were defined entities or monsters, uh, if you like, that formed open and messy and intractable environments. Um, and these uh, kind of discontinuous uh, histories and resistant geographies, which disrupted uh, global capitalist and, and colonial projects. They interrupted, if only partially, uh, the flows of global capital, as well as the continuity of Western colonial orders. Their persistence throughout the 20th century produced a kind of historical and temporal displacement that just dis disrupted the totalizing spatial movement of capitalism and its unified world history. And they reordered the world with a force. I want to say uh, something about the complexity of history also, that socialism is only part of a complex history in Eastern Europe and the Balkans in particular, and the colonial worldview cannot tolerate the complexity of its other. I'm working from the context of post-socialist Bulgaria, which is ambiguously positioned on the cusp of three different um, uh, historical and political contexts, the Ottoman Empire, the Soviet Socialist Project, uh, and the current uh, kind of Euro European Union regime. And uh, situated on the margins of these geopolitical formations, in the shadow of their historical legacies or political influences, Bulgaria casts a unique light on the worlds it is enmeshed in, but never entirely belongs to. Because of the layering of these multiple histories, the Bulgarian and Balkan context is quite dense. In it, entwined and colliding worlds coexist in ways that creates, create zones of illegibility. Um, uh, they're not legible uh, or they're discordant. And so they create zones of discord uh, that are too much to unpack. Uh, so our region um, often suffers either marginalization or simplification. So it's too much for the Westerner to unpack um, uh, and they prefer to either simplify or uh, to completely ignore and uh, erase it. Uh, so let us remember that this is one of the ways in which colonial power works uh, by flattening the histories and cultures of the people uh, they want to control and dominate by forcing them into simple binaries and oppositions mm, and so on. But our history always uh, re-emerges in unruly and defiant ways. Also here, geography itself becomes a guiding methodology for a post and decolonial reassessment by taking as its starting point the peripheries and the margins, uh, which has already appeared in, 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 in many different ways in, in the previous discussion. 
Often at the thresholds of multiple worlds, our marginal geographies contain dense historical and cultural layerings. They have the power to disrupt the coherence of homogenous and monolithic forms of thinking. And um, my last point is about socialist history in the context of uh, Europeanization uh, in, in, in Bulgaria in particular. In the last three decades, the material culture of the socialist past was stigmatized, destroyed, erased, appropriated, and become a resource of capitalist accumulation in unforeseeable ways. In Bulgaria, this process has become particularly intense after the country joined the European Union as Bulgarian society reimagined itself as a Western and uh, a European nation. Uh, and of course, joining the, EU, the European Union was by no means the beginning uh, of this process. But here in Bulgaria, as well as in other East European countries, Europeanization has become almost synonymous with decommunization, an agenda often pushed with the help of vaguely worded legislation that criminalizes in absurdly sweeping uh, terms the cultural, material, and the symbolic legacies of an entire historical period, that of the quote unquote evil communist regime. Many of us have called attention to this disturbing trend. What is more in the Bulgarian context, it is becoming more evident that Europeanization has also been forcefully claimed as a right-wing project and has empowered some of the most extreme ethnophobic, Islamophobic, racist, anti-immigrant, homophobic, and patriarchal political tendencies in the country. This climate has encouraged the flourishing of outright fascist formations, which continue to thrive in grassroots forms in the, par in the parliament, in media and in public uh, space. And right now queer and trans people are kind of at the forefront of the anti-fascist struggle uh, because they are subject to um, daily physical attacks and harassment and uh, uh, physical threats. Um, and we have countless, uh, countless um, um, incidents uh, of this uh, targeted uh, harassment um, um, in the last um, several years, including uh, recently an LGBTQ uh, activist and community center called the, the Rainbow Hub, which was um, which was uh, attacked and vandalized and, uh, by an ultra-nationalist uh, political party or members of it, um, and people were injured. And, and this is just one of the examples of how a queer uh, people and women are at the forefront of the anti-fascist struggle with their bodies uh, right now in their daily lives. Um, so, uh, also, uh, various right-wing forces from moderate liberals to the far right have used the demonization of the socialist past, past to recuperate fascist history from the interwar period in Bulgaria to restore and even fetishize its material culture, uh, a lot of it carrying military, authoritarian, nationalist, and outright fascist content. Mm, many activists and scholars have been speaking out against this alarming tendency. Uh, moderate liberals have advocated for those kinds of restorations by romanticizing um, bourgeois life from the pre-socialist period. Liberals have um, disavowed the local histories of fascism and dismissed or minimized Bulgaria's alliance with the Nazis during World War II. New fascists and nationalist, national patriots push consciously and with full awareness for the recuperation of historical figures and for the restoration of material culture from the interwar period with its anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim and expansionist content. As a result of this fusion of anti-communist liberal, liberalism, new liberal capitalism and fascist nationalism, pronounced fascists and Nazi supporters are seen as victims of communist repression and commemorated in monuments. Right-wing nationalist and fascist, fascist organization, organizations from the interwar period banned by the socialist government after 1944 have now reestablished their public presence and activity. Extreme right-wing parties with direct links to fascist politics and figures have, continuously, have been continuously present in the parliament and the public sphere for several decades now, having the power to shape the law as well as public opinion. The turn to new liberal and right-wing politics in the post-socialist countries is a direct effect of the demise and devaluation of the socialist worlds from the 20th century. 
As new liberal and right-wing agendas are emboldened from the top down and the bottom up, reverberating across continents, because this kind of post-socialist um, situation is a global situation, how we read and mobilize the history of 20th century socialisms in Eastern Europe and the rest of the world becomes a crucial question. In these disturbing times, socialist history appears as a restless history, as a source of inspiration and power to draw from and to be mobilized in struggles against fascism and against the xenophobic, racist, homophobic and patriarchal currents of the day. In its un unsettling multiplicity, it appears as an unfinished and a ghostly history a history that will never rest. Thank you. Thank you, Zivka, so much. Uh, this was very important contribution. I would like to ask you like thousands of questions now, but I will leave them uh, after uh, the all the presenters have presented their their notions. Uh, Piero, uh, the floor is yours now. Please uh, uh, introduce uh, your concept uh, of Raceless region. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm not sure there's really anything that I can add to what Jivka said or what previous uh, panelists have said in this uh, uh, webinar or seminar series. But I think uh, it's very important in a way that we're acknowledging that the debates about the relationship between racial capitalism and coloniality are becoming more relevant in the ways in which we think of our region of our region in our recent past. So I, I was going to talk about uh, racial capitalism and coloniality as a way of uh, thinking about the protracted and complex continuities and connectivities of capital and colonial expansion to the ongoing shifts and transformations of racial and, ca ra racial and carceral capitalism. So needless to say, these connections are rarely straightforward or self-evident as they are frequently obscured by national temporalities and Euro-American hegemonic epistemologies. The starting point is perhaps to acknowledge that no part of the world remains untouched by modernity coloniality. And I don't think our region is an exception to this. The challenge of thinking through these processes from each region, therefore, requires different methods and vocabularies that at times are concurrent with global debates about anti-capitalism, decolonization and abolition, and at times depart from them. I say this because, for instance, our vocabularies of decolonization and anti-capitalism are mostly informed by Marxist praxis, but also our socialist past. And this is not necessarily the case in other parts of the world where decolonization and decoloniality can and frequently does, especially in the settler colonial context, take indigenous forms of resistance for whom Marxism can also be a product of European modernity and epistemology. So I bring this up here because I think it's important to acknowledge the tensions and contradictions in decolonial praxis and thoughts. So there are two main challenges, I think, um, that require closer attention in relation to how we approach these debates. And one of them is racism, which is generally erased or replaced with nationalism or similar colorblind class critique or raceless politics, as Yelena Savage pointed out in her presentation earlier. And the other one is, how do we think about colonialism and coloniality? I address this too, and not so much capitalism, because like I said, while there exists a strong praxis of anti-capitalist politics, critique of capitalism is generally assumed raceless and colonialist and rendered through frequently orthodox and Eurocentric Marxist critique that generally discounts the work of black Marxist thought and even more so of decolonial and indigenous praxis. Thus, when we think of labor and class struggle, the question of racialized labor in our region is almost entirely absent, even though our cities and industries were not only built by racialized labor, but also through the displacement of racialized communities. So for instance, if we think of the de-Ottomanization of Belgrade and Novi Sad, which at different times in history were uh, continue to be the Roma, Muslim, or other racialized communities, and more recently and increasingly migrant workers. So for instance, today there's an absence in thinking also about how carceral and racial capitalism function in our region that is connected to coloniality in the sense that there is now a region-wide multi-billion industry financed by the EU 
to create carceral spaces along the Balkan route where Europe seeks to seek its racial borderlands by sponsoring migrant prisons, encampments, and confinement spaces. So when we think of capitalism, I guess I think we have to start thinking about racial and carceral capitalism, because obviously labor under capitalism is always racialized and gendered, but also connected to colonial racial geographies of where Europe starts and ends. So the questions that emerge then of who builds these carceral camps, who benefits from them and who is contained in them, as Daniela Maistorovic also pointed out about the camps in Bosnia today in the previous session. If the camps are sponsored by Europe, built by Balkan states to contain and imprison refugees, then what is going on here? We can answer this perhaps by asking how colonial cartographies that define the racial borders of Europe and whiteness render this containment of refugees today as necessary measure to protect those borders. So how the regional borderization and incarceration of refugees work in tandem with the integration of the region into the EU at the price of policing its racial borders, I think it's an important question. I think Zivka also is touching on especially how the EU integration process has contributed to this. Also because it's not just a regional issue in as much as it's an issue that's visible and it replicates itself on a local and a state level. So the policing of borders, be it those of cities, states, or post-national formations like the EU, require the continuous confinement of racialized communities. Um, so I remember how in Bulgaria, for instance, in 2017 and 18, um, there were massive nationwide protests against Roma aggression which required the confinement of Roma neighborhoods in places like Asenovgrad and Sofia that were concurrent and converging with the larger anti-refugee and border enforcement that was happening in Bulgaria at the time. I think the coalition government in power was good. Um, so I think it's also important to remember that these are not just projects of the far right and outright fascist governments like the Hungarian one, but also projects that define left and right political formations. Um, so since, since this is an art forum, I wanted to give an example of how artists in the region are intervening to expose and perhaps make sense of these links. Selma Selman's work, for instance, raises the question about Roma racism in the region that unsettles not just the politics of the far right, but also the silence and compliance with racism of leftist movements. One of the best commentaries of this intersection of racial capitalism, class, gender, and coloniality in post-socialism is her performance piece, Self-Portrait. In it, Selma takes electronic waste that people deposit in Roma neighborhoods across the peripheries of post-socialist cities to demolish them in the city center. In my conversations with Selma, she describes this process as a performance as wanting to spare no one from what the noise of capitalist violence sounds like. So she says, you can't deposit your waste in the periphery and return to the comfort of the center to make abstract noise about rights. For instance, I choose to demolish a washing machine because I was trying to point out how the work of waste recycling that takes place in Roma neighborhoods forces us to reckon with the races, gendered and environmental violence that results from capitalism. And I, I think Selma's work is also important because it confronts the convergence of post-socialist left and liberal peripheralization of the question of racism and refugees, it also exposes their comfortable collusion with the EU and its captive and carceral border regimes in the region. Because Selma comes from Bihać, which is the site of refugees where the space that was once used for refugees from the Bosnian genocide now serves as EU sponsored camps for migrant detention, connecting her own racialized reality in Bosnia to the refugees that are being pursued along the Balkan route to prevent them from entering Europe. In a virtual <clears throat> performance called No Space, she says that there is no space for you here, which is a term that Roma encounter in the Balkans when looking for jobs or housing. It's not just disconnected from the same message being given to refugees when they are told that there is no space for you here. So to return to the guiding question of this seminar series of how to decolonize art organization, I don't think that we can define the how because people are always doing, people are already doing it in aesthetic forms that speak to the realities that surround them. What I think remains important in my mind, and that is very obvious in Selma's work as well, 
is to continue to engage with each other by always keeping in mind our local, regional, and global positions in relation to power, capital, and coloniality. Simply acknowledging this is neither a solution uh, nor a redemption, but rather a starting point of our praxis. Otherwise, we fall prey to reproducing the kind of Europe obstructionist thought that separates the theorists from the real politics, as Surya Butelja reminds us in her attempts to dismantle the foundations of white good conscience in its abstract uh, humanism. So I'll stop here. Um, I would just add that I, I'm really excited by the idea of translating with Anna uh, some, of the, some of the texts that I think are common references in all our talks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for this. This was very important, especially this last point about, you know, always having in mind, you know, not to stay in the sphere of abstract thinking and, you know, having uh, in mind that uh, uh, it is about changing the world now. Um, Anna, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Anna will. Uh, Anna is a, a museum worker uh, and an art theorist, and she will present about uh, a notion anti-colonial museum that she has been developing in practice and in her museum work. So I think this is also very important angle to see how um, anti-colonial is anti-colonial museum possible in practice. So to say, no. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for the invitation to you and to Kuda and, uh, of course, to all the colleagues uh, participating. It was really wonderful listening today to the previous session. And, uh, uh, well, an anti-colonial museum. In this presentation, I will actually give a context uh, for my work, uh, tackle the criticism of a museum as such, and deliberate on the notion of an anti-colonial museum taking as a case study uh, the Museum of African Art, uh, the Veda and Dr. Zdravko Petr collection in Belgrade, and uh, my collaboration with them that has taken the shape of an anti-colonial uh, museum project uh, last year. However, it is just a kind of, um, well, it's a continuation of my now almost 20 years long research um, about this museum and about the possibility of this museum to, well, let's say, try to achieve the impossible, and that is being an anti-colonial museum, because as we all probably know, no museum is um, anti-colonial anti as such, at least not yet. And uh, in order to understand why, uh, we need to go a little bit uh, further back um, to museums as institutions, as products of imperial and colonial discourse and context. Uh, the way the museums are set up, um, the way they're organized, uh, their methodologies are systematized, how the, this privilege of looking and commenting on everything was established, including the right uh, of displaying uh, something or someone <laughs> to the old piercing entitled gaze. All of these elements of museum work have a long history and a considerate uh, role and responsibility in knowledge production, which was based upon hierarchies that presumed one culture or one uh, human life to be more or less uh, valuable or important in the next one. So there are numerous ways that museums are actually exercising control over their narratives and um, they are great manipulators <laughs> in a way. They're great manipulators of time and of space. And in combining these ways of manipulation, they were establishing uh, control over master narratives such as history is a master narrative uh, prescribing subsequently the regimes of uh, visibility and invisibility of different protagonists, of different events, of different meanings. And such normalized production of knowledge is already uh, set up to produce further inequalities. And uh, having in mind their long history that uh, crafted them in a particular way, uh, just this formal education was conceived in a particular way that has become normalized to us, we need to think of museums as normative systems. And we are in need of uh, the colonial and anti-colonial work uh, that has to be done on and in museums, not because museums are absolutely necessary. And I can say that after 20 years of dealing with museums, but because they are already there as a meaning producing normalized and culturally accepted interface for co communicating certain ideas and uh, uh, those ideas are reaching us in a, in, a, in a particular way. 
And now um, the Museum of African Art, uh, the Vedan Dr. Zarko Petr um, collection in Belgrade has been proclaimed uh, uh, at the time of its opening in 1977 as the only anti-colonial museum exhibiting African art in Europe. <laughs> it was due to the socialist Yugoslavia's positioning within the non-aligned movement and its ties to anti-colonial movements um, in African countries that the museum fostered such discourse. And more importantly, uh, it did strive to seek new models uh, of representation, recognizing that the museums in the West were formed out of uh, quote unquote colonial plunder, which was part of the more general socialist criticism of capitalism. And uh, a major change happened uh, in the 1990s. Uh, the devastating wars in the post Yugoslav region have left, uh, left uh, deep wounds uh, in a different traumatic capacity. And as a result, uh, as part of the all the encompassing erasure of the socialist Yugoslavia and its values, something that we already had been, been uh, talked about, uh, what they call the affective heritage, uh, affective also the word we, that, we, we, that we heard uh, in Daniela's um, presentation, the affective heritage of non-alignment and anti-colonialism was all but forgotten. And uh, renewed interest in non-alignment and anti-colonialism virtually exploded in the last 10 years. And it is a part of uh, the search for the alternative models of existing in the world. And uh, it uh, also resulted, however, in an often uncritical and uh, actually one-sided view of, of this museum as, as anti-colonial, which uh, I have to say it is not. Uh, and it really deserves an additional theorization as well as uh, um, needed, very much needed changes in the museum practice, and I will explain why, uh, which are among the questions that we are uh, dealing with uh, within the current project uh, Anti-Colonial Museum, and it, the project tries to bring those uh, issues forward. And the project relies on decolonial thinking that was actually uh, let's say reintroduced into the museum some 18 years ago, starting with the exhibition by Dejan Sretenovic uh, at the time curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade. Uh, the exhibition's title was uh, Black Body, White Mask. You can actually recognize the reference. And uh, uh, it was actually commenting on this kind of both, well, let's say continuity and discontinuity of this museum with Western practice. And uh, after this exhibition in 2006, there was another really excellent um, artwork actually, installation artwork uh, by Bartelemi Togo. Um, and he named it homage to Draco Petr. And uh, it was very uh, ironic <laughs> title because in, in his view, he actually saw this kind of accumulation of objects through collecting North African art, uh, not different within the socialist or communist society than in any other museum uh, in the world. So um, these, these projects were uh, in a way also the, the, the kind of, um, well, the, the, the point where I became very much interested in, in uh, dealing with decolonial thinking at the time I was employed as a curator in this museum and very soon actually I left afterwards. Uh, neither of the projects were, uh, were leaving a, a more permanent mark on the institution and, and actually took m m much longer to actually start even thinking about whether this museum can be changed and how. And now, um, based on my subsequent uh, PhD thesis and the projects that span uh, over more than a decade, uh, I will uh, present to you three methodological steps that had to do with bringing decolonial and anti-colonial within museum, uh, which are detection, um, then something that I call historization or rehistorization, and uh, emancipation, well, hopefully. And in practice, some of these steps overlap and repeat, and I will also bring to your attention as to how the focus uh, of what is being detected, uh, historicized and emancipated has also moved from uh, an object towards a discourse in the last 20 years, which makes relying solely on formal traces, whether of collections, uh, photographs, documents, audio and film recordings, extremely problematic. And detection obviously started by posing the question, uh, what is wrong with this picture? And um, the way I approached this uh, phase was by delineating colonial and anti-colonial practice within the museum. 
and um, ethnographizing and uh, the collecting of African art as a construed field, which is, or, 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 okay, this is something I, I can talk very long about and I will not go into the detail here about it, but it is a very important question. Uh, so this kind of construction of African art within the museum context was what this uh, museum had in common with uh, colonial models of representation. However, certain emancipatory anti-colonial practice that we could actually use today in museum practice uh, reflected in collaboration focus on contemporaneity and diverse modes of producing knowledge and learning. And the problem with uh, was the emancipatory thinking uh, set at the beginning of the museum's functioning was no longer supported by the, let's say, values or lived values of the anti-colonialism, anti-racism and solidarity after they disappeared from the public discourse. And um, this is actually where this rehistorization was necessary. It was basically a research work on mapping uh, counter histories, erase protagonists, facts and discourse, but also recognizing the models of knowledge production that uh, contributed to their erasure in the first place. And uh, this step was brought to the museum display through an exhibition in the form of an interpolation of a long title, Nympha Koron and Zizi, One Man No Chop. Uh, this, this line actually is kind of informal catchphrase of the museum and it had to do uh, with, uh, with non-alignment and kind of solidarity, unity, etc. And in the continuation, it goes reconceptualization of the Museum of African Arts. So in a way, the idea about reconceptualization started uh, some five years ago, it was in 2017. And uh, besides problematizing ethnographization and collecting, uh, the exhibition brought forward the, the invisible or unrecognized collections and documents. Actually, those were not really seen as uh, collections or documents. Uh, th those were, uh, let's say, uh, materials bequeathed to the Museum Bazraku Petr and Veda Zagorets, uh, but they were kind of invisible within the museum setting, formal setting. And I have to say that collaboration with the colleagues here was immensely important, uh, such as with uh, Olivier Dushi, a film theorist. He was actually the first one to re-evaluate after a very long time, the photographs and the documents referring to the Algerian war for independence that uh, Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr wholeheartedly supported. And he did it within the project Non-Aligned Modernisms, which was led by Zora Neric, uh, curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade, uh, roughly from 2012 to, to 2016. And uh, you can actually read uh, about this in the, uh, Adushi's publication for the museum. Um, it is called the Images of uh, Non-Aligned and Tricontinental Struggles from 2016. And um, besides the erasure of values of anti-colonialism, anti-racism and solidarity, Conspicuous was the, the erasure of women, uh, such as uh, an almost entirely, an entirely erased contribution of, of Veda Zagorets to the founding of the Museum of African Art, which is something that uh, uh, both my colleague Emilia Epstein, with whom I did the exhibition, Nympa Kornadzidzi, and the historian Nemanja Radonic wrote about. And um, you can actually see young Veda, and uh, here is uh, she with the Adwa Keita, uh, a very important Malian uh, uh, anti-colonial fighter. Um, and uh, even though historization may seem to have uh, yielded kind of a proof that a particular, well, the particular failure happened in decolonization of mind back in the 1960s and 70s, I actually prefer to see this histor historicized discourse as an affective heritage, as I mentioned. It is kind of a potentiality that we can connect to a hope that a different approach in regard to hierarchies of power can indeed be possible. However, it should not be seen uncritically because had it worked out, uh, we would not be living in societies where xenophobia, chauvinism, and nationalism and patriarchy still lead the way as, as, as we already mentioned so many times. And uh, uh, actually in a way, the bringing back of these notions of anti-colonialism, anti-racism and solidarity and kind of my persistent 
uh, repetition of these notions was actually about bringing them within the public discourse, because once they're back into the public discourse, you can actually really start the real work on, on building um, a, a real criticism of these notions as well, because if they're invisible, there will be no further criticism. And uh, finally, uh, I talked about emancipation um, and in this context, it would mean thinking beyond historization. And I think that Daniela also mentioned this in her uh, presentation. In other words, it means finding um, an authentic language, recognizing your position, and doing the necessary work on unlearning certain, let's say, quote unquote, truths that were normalized in our own societies. And uh, emancipation has, to, has yet to challenge what we were talking a lot about today, and those, those are the issues of Yugoslav exceptionalism in regard to construction of race. Uh, I mean, whether we call it racial blindness or, or a white innocence or exceptionalism in such case. And um, also it, 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 is, um, it is linked to this kind of reluctance to recognize your own position within the global racialized hierarchies. And in a way it is no longer possible. And uh, a partially inspired by Buona Pishkur, She's curator at the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Ljubljana in, in Slovenia. Um, she took part in uh, one very interesting uh, conference that I also took part in, a non-aligned museum. It was proposed by Katarina Zivanovic for the Museum of Yugoslavia in 2016. And she had a really interesting idea about what, an, uh, what the, a non-aligned museum would be. And in a way, you know, building, building on her case, I also, uh, thought about what, what then the, the anti-colonial museum would be for the Museum of African Art. And uh, I, I had two, let's say, most important lines of thinking. One was reactualization of the affirmative legacies that were, it was built in mind with uh, in the first place, but not in form of artifacts, but of values. And uh, the second would be employing the knowledge produced so far uh, within different collaborations with theorists, curators, and artists in order to disrupt the museum as such, as a colonial institution per se. And uh, broken down into steps, it would look like a kind of list of recommendations for, for uh, but it, I, I would have to say, uh, I have a hope that this can actually be applied for different institutions and not actually this one. The museum served in a particular way as this kind of affective heritage or a kind of uh, aide memoir or something that actually brings those notions back. But not necessarily is this museum the condition of having an anti-colonial museum. It is more of an idea that should be kind of woven through different institutions. And uh, as I said, broken down into steps, the recommendations would be uh, the museum should delineate the values uh, it stands by. Um, this is something from the museum collection as well, photographs. Um, so values and express those values clearly, inscribe them into every segment of its work. Uh, it means also setting the anti-colonial, decolonial, anti-racist, anti-fascist thinking as main lines of research, work, exhibiting, publishing, as well as its, pub as, as its public engagement and actions. Uh, it should consider the active and changing roles of communities in thinking of heritage and museums among them, the decentralization of decision-making, use and care, a current and potential displacement of constituencies, which is something that we are seeing every day. Transformations of social and legally recognized roles of individuals and groups or introduction of previously unrecognized individual or group formal or informal participants that would affect how both past and future will be construed. Uh, it should establish collaboration with individuals, organizations and institutions that would not be based on a perceived importance of a particular institution within the existing hierarchies. And this is something that I consider very important, but rather on the knowledge they can contribute with. And in relation to this, it should not ever talk on someone else's behalf, but rather open the space for other people uh, who actually have a lived experience about a particular topic to share their point of view on topics that primarily concern them or are they knowledgeable about. And it should most certainly not use other people as informants. And this is something that I, I think that Jika also mentioned. So many times we were also in the position of this kind of colonial um, relation where we are just informants and telling other people and other researchers about the things that primarily concern us and then just getting a kind of, you know, a, a little mention on the end of, of someone else's work. And um, 
it should have a long delay perception of the phenomena it would engage with, uh, solving through past, present, and future in a responsible and conscious manner. And it should be serving as an intersection of imagined past and imagined future, and not only look back or forward, but actually understand the urgency of the moment we have found ourselves in and link all of its production to contemporary articulation of our current state as a society. And uh, in conclusion, I can only say that uh, anti-colonial in the name of the project is not a state of permanency. This is something that Anna was talking about as well. All of this is a process and it is a continuous and uh, very much uh, com community-based or communal or joint project uh, and the work uh, on changing the paradigm of knowledge production that is of course not only the matter of museums but also of different work in, in heritage and culture and education. So thank you very much. <laughs> Let me just thank you, Anna, stop so here. Okay. For, for sharing, I mean, this is very important points and I'm looking forward to expanding on this uh, in, in the conversation. And I also want to thank you a lot for sharing all of these images because many people to whom I mentioned what Anna will talk about didn't know about this uh, museum in Belgrade. So I think uh, this is important to acknowledge that this is there is something like that <laughs> still uh, living and, you know, trying to produce some kind of knowledge. Um, and last but not the least, uh, Emina Bozinkic uh, will talk uh, about uh, her approach uh, in research uh, with refugees that she has been doing uh, recently for her PhD, but also in her activist uh, work. Emina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Can you just confirm that you see the slide? I confirm we can see everything perfectly and we can hear you. That's beautiful, thank you. Thank you for having me today, uh, both you, Anna and Kuda, and for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I think I come with a, with a methodological musing that slightly diverges from previous discussions. However, it grapples with the very complex modes of power, disintegrations, um, distortions, dominations that are orchestrated by the global white supremacists uh, or supremacy um, that was just beautifully elaborated and in such profound ways by Jeeves, uh, Piro and um, Anna. So thank you for this um, um, ignite and impulse uh, from, from three of you. Um, at the very beginning, I would like to um, stress that I situate uh, this presentation and my journey with decolonizing research with refugees in um, long lasting struggles for epistemic justice and particularly the transnational feminist praxis that nourishes my ethical commitments. Um, and at the same time, I engage with um, decolonizing research as a counteraction to the extractive nature of traditional research, um, often laboring as epistemic violence and erasure of subordinated communities and their experiences. And I also anchored the praxis of decolonizing research as means of counteraction to Islamophobia, anti-Black and anti-Muslim racism, anti-migration politics, um, misogyny, and all forms of violence of patriarchy, and all forms of colonization, occupation, and imperialism. Um, in this presentation today, I engage with three themes. The first one regards the practice of decolonizing research through the collective memory writing with young refugees from Middle East who have been finding a new home in Croatia between 2015 long summer of migration and now. The collective memory writing um, sessions um, took place amid the COVID-19 pandemic and the earthquakes hitting central Croatia from the end of 2020. And these two events um, become major theme and I will touch upon those um, as I speak later on. The second theme ruminates on the labor of representations, languages and uh, translation. And then the third one discusses collective memory writing process as an emerging site for the questions of self in the work of um, decoloniality. 
And these themes are integrated through the presentation, either as a text or subtext, as they follow the commitment of complicating the structure and the logic while walking uh, the path of more of a generative, fractured, and fragmented, just as our memories and our lives are. I will also start this presentation with a diary entry uh, dated March of 2021, a year after the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and a couple of months after the devastating earthquake in my hometown of Sisak uh, in Croatia, to, to set the context of, uh, of my research and um, decolonizing endeavors. Um, I write this diary entry from a place of acute vulnerability and survival as the literal tectonic movements have been striking central Croatia, causing displacement, devastation, and discomfort. Uh, magnitude 6.4 earthquake at the end of 2020, preceded by three forceful ones, struck and led to debris, dislocation, and death. Thousands of aftershocks have been occurring in the aftermath releasing waves of energy traveling through the Earth's crust. According to the Science for a Changing World, an earthquake happens when the tectonic plates get unstuck at their edges. When the friction releases, a powerful amount of energy causes a sudden slip on a fold. A sudden slip, numerous ones as a matter of fact, unsettled sense of home and safety, knowing the already fragile social tissue amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, defying the stay-at-home order in the most literal sense of words as home became unsolidified. Situated within the floating danger of COVID-19 virus, the post-earthquake post crisis imposed the impossibility of physical distancing and hygienic requirements to remain healthy in the collective shelters for weeks after the main shock. Destined to the proximity of each other, surrounded by the fallen facades, suddenly layers of social assemblage came through. Refugees, ethnic minorities, elderly, people with disabilities, and others structurally deprived met in the long queues while waiting for aid packages and food, with the tectonic plates constantly moving underneath our feet. Some 30 years ago, when the war in the Balkans stumbled our lives, sending threats from the land, sea, and air, many of us became refugees overnight, temporary and for life. And here I stand again in the same place, exiled from home, holding transgenerational memories of suffering with a community of, of Iranian and Syrian refugees holding each other, shivering in each other's arms and facing the unexpected anxiety of another stage of survival. Again, and always in the shoes of perpetual refugees, I wander into the world of imagining the labor of reconstruction as more than fixing the broken in which we all take part, vulnerable and resilient as we are. Committing ourselves to the reconstruction and restoration urges for catching a breath while preparing the grounds for new ways of thinking, breathing, knowing, creating, sustaining. End of diary entry. I meditate here on the questions of the meanings, possibilities, and refusals emerging from the moments of seismic shifts, literally and figuratively. In what ways can we intimately and collectively set ourselves to that journey of the unknown in all its uncertainties, however, in a profound excitement and politicality of the possible? What might we learn from the experiences of death and earthquakes both natural and inevitable occurrences that can inform our deliberations, connections, and moves about the ways of knowing about the natural world, human fragility, and hope. What paths do we need to depart so we can walk those of liberation and, and emancipation from the corroded, old, and oppressed? What labor must we commit to in order to regain hope and use those energies to evacuate our balloon of fear and subordination and grasp the complexities we are embedded in. What labor must we undertake intimately and collectively to reimagine the praxis of possibility making? These very questions emerged for me as I embarked on the ship of collective memory writing with young refugees, 
living and being schooled in Croatia, with whom I had been standing on the shaky grounds. So the collective memory writing research project was the labor of sharing our life stories. And it began with the pandemic when schools shut their doors and switched to online schooling in the Croatian language. Refugee youth were cast out of the education system in silence for not knowing the dominant language. For 18 months, I spoke to each of them. We had marked long hours of conversations by muddling through the meanings of social distancing intersecting at the COVID-19 pandemic, societal pandemic like Islamophobia and anti-Black racism, and the enhanced securitization politics that normalizes racialization and criminalization of refugees and migrants. The method of collective memory writing revealed serendipitously and had grown out of the earlier practice of narrative sharing and even collaborative autobiographies that Aisha, one of my collaborators, and I set ourselves on. In this 18 months long journey, we had organized numerous encounters, including four day long writing session, where we collectively wrote about our experiences of displacement, displacements. We engaged with memory as a living and walking archive, or even a map that discloses critical knowledges about silences sitting and, uh, under the pressures of the racialized systems of oppression. Our map reading through story writing led us to profound conversational analysis, whether one of us was 14, 22, or 38. Collective writing of our memories of war, refuge, child labor, deportations, and all sorts of erasures in schooling was the liberation of silenced truths and refusals to fit in the racialized and gendered patterns of backwardness and subknowing. Thus, this has represented a mode of political empowerment. For instance, it led us to organize local women's circle, solidarity action readings for Palestine after May occupation, and taking part in the Black Lives Matter movement emerged after the murder of George Floyd. Our labor of writing, recording, and sharing stories in multiple languages brought creativity, messiness, questions, confusions, liberations, trusts, relationships, and new life energies. We have not only occupied a space of writers with different styles and listeners with open and closed eyes, but locations of friendships and kinship as we celebrated birthdays and weddings, practiced fasting, mothering, and community care, and mourned the losses of our community members. Deeply involved in the collective memory writing of our refugee journeys, life in camps, uh, perilous crossings of borders, new life amid pandemic, exile from schooling and displacement by the earthquake, and our fears, desires, sexualities, shames, and joys. The instigation and inspiration for this project came from three examples. We explored Frigga Haug's collective memory writing work with Das Argument Collective in Germany that instigated the methodology, pivoting feminist projects globally. We worked with Richa Nagar's journey with Santin writers and SKMS Collective in, in India and the practice of radical vulnerability that seeks to reimagine the, tem the temporalities and meanings of knowledge-making partnerships by surrendering to a politics of co-traveling and co-authorship, politics that are accompanied by difficult refusals. Uh, relationality embedded in radical vulnerability strives to internalize that our self is intensely co-constituted and entangled with the other. We have also learned and engaged with Ella Shohat's project of feminist relationality. Shohat asserts that any dialogue about such fictive unities called Middle Eastern women, for example, especially dialogues taking place within transnational frameworks, has to begin with the premise that genders, sexualities, races, classes, nations, and even continents exist not as hermetically, hermetically sealed entities, but rather as part of the permeable interwoven relationality. The interlinking of critical maps of knowledge is fundamental in a transnational age typified by the global travels of images, sounds, goods, and populations. 
a relational feminist project is therefore to analyze this new moment that requires rethinking identity designations, intellectual grids, and disciplinary boundaries. We grappled with the questions of language and translation in our feminist project. What does it mean to practice decoloniality while grappling with the questions of voice, language, and translation? The writing experience unfolded in multiple languages, the language of home, the language of the refugee camp, the language of the new place, Arabic, Croatian, and English. We also communicated by using hands, gestures, facial expressions, drawing visuals, using dictionaries and cell applications, and thus we translated. In facing the fears with what might be lost with the labor of translation, we liberated ourselves and our work by engaging with Richa Nagar's concept of hungry translation, described as it recognizes that the meanings of justice ethics or politics can emerge only in the shifting specifics of a given moment in an ongoing struggle. A particular convergence of subjectivities and articulations that is itself located at a unique confluence of time and place. And this impossibility of arriving at perfect translation, the political potential of such engagement lies in this yearning to keep retellings as well as the relationships that energize and authorize those retellings, open and flowing. Such an honest sitting in a place of fragmented memories and imperfect translations, but the wholeness of voice or what Patricia Connolly Schaffer terms as epistemic wholeness, speak to the practice of lived solidarities or even situated solidarity discussed in Nagar's Mudding the Waters those situated solidarities reflected in writing and publishing of the work as discussed in Nagar's Playing with Fire, where stories shared by each group member were not individualized and reduced to a singular, but rather went on their journey of embroidery of a collective voice where a single story renders more power as it becomes part of the collective one. It is both Friga Haug and Richa Nagar work with two powerful collectives that ignited the process of interweaving stories as a collective political mode of lived solidarities while living in multiple languages, radical vulnerability and hungry translations. As mentioned at the beginning, this meditation is embedded in the commitment to nourish praxis of decolonizing research, integrating ethics and political empowerment of the collective pedagogies of blurring the boundaries between the researcher and the researched and critical senses to the new and emerging ways of knowing. Here I draw on two indigenous scholars, Linda Tivai Smith from New Zealand, who discusses the concept of culturally relevant research methodologies and protocols and Native American Robin Wall Kimmerer's concept of honorable harvest that disrupt the research that is disrespectful and exploitative. Devi Smith surfaces the question of self by asking in what ways decolonizing of self happens side by side, individually and collectively. So what might it mean to end the exploitative research practices and act in a full respect and solidarity with those whom research is done with? While pondering on the labor and praxis of collective memory writing and its possibilities for us to overcome pain and suffering, we are determined to seek the truths about who we are through the entangled narratives, reaching beyond the popular tropes of Muslim terrorists, Muslim women as oppressed, and migrants and refugees as cultural aliens, as well as for justice under our terms, perhaps a poetic justice emerging from the writing process or solidarity actions. I will end by saying that the method of collective memory writing then becomes more than a method, but rather a site of Shohat's feminist relational project it weaves into a quilt of emotional, spiritual, and political labor of regaining hope and imagining critical difference against the perpetual ideological dis displacements of refugee youth and other subordinated communities from social, educational, and other interactions. So to circle back to the very beginning, I ponder on the figurative power of the earthquake. 
while the event of the earthquake has been a life-changing event that surfaced our fragilities and triggered our earlier displacement experiences, it has also been a well-needed metaphorical tremor, setting us on the journey of the collective memory writing, collective knowledge production, and urging us to release new energy of hope and imagination with and beyond refusals. Thank you. Thank you, Amina, so much. Uh, um, this was su such a beautiful presentation, and you put it in such a beautiful words. Uh, um, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, these are the methods that, uh, uh, um, you know, like, uh, I, I have a feeling that this is something that, that we all need to kind of like, lear, uh, the, to de-school ourselves from the, 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 the research methods that, that we have been using in, in, in our work. And it's not always an easy task, but you went like very deep into that and found the, the way to, to kind of formulate all of these things. And um, yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing this uh, with us. So I want to ask you all now, uh, uh, the previous panel was uh, uh, strictly rebelling against the comfort break. I want to ask you if you feel like having a five minutes break or do you want to just continue with discussion? Continue. Okay. So um, I would like to um, ask you, uh, Zivka, now if you have any questions for uh, other participants uh, to, to start the discussion. I, I just want to kind of, I'm still processing and I want to take a little bit of time for these beautiful presentations and thank you all for this incredible panel. And so I'm also interested in uh, hearing what the, our um, um, this, uh, this audience is going to say. So I'm just going to pass and let others speak. Piero. Would you like to, to take over from, from Zivka or are you still processing yourself? <laughs> I mean, I have so many questions, but I think there's, there's also so much overlap. I mean, it doesn't seem so between Anna's and Amina's presentation in the sense that there's these uh, non-aligned solidarities that emerged during the Cold War, right? That Anna, talks about sort of in a way in which Yugoslavia sought to position itself globally as a decolonizing power through the non-aligned movement. Um, and what can we do on that history today? Or how, how do we think politically through that history today? Um, and Amina's, I think, overlaps in the sense that there's also, I mean, at least the way I experienced the, pre the presentation is a, there's, a, there's also a post-Ottoman sociability to the connections that we make with refugees um, along the Balkan route, because frequently um, these were all spaces that were considered part of like one political formation. And so there's been also refugees from the Balkans that have traveled in the opposite direction. And so what, what we make of that as well. But I think, I, I mean, I'm not sure I have a question, but um, maybe this also relates to the debates that were, that came in the previous panel about how, how do we think about the role that Yugoslavia played in the decolonizing world vis-a-vis the internal colonization within Yugoslavia, particularly settler colonial Yugoslav projects in Macedonia and Kosovo, that were, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, that were part and parcel of what it of of what it meant to be Yugoslav, not just in the pre, not in the Kraljevina alone, but also in the Socialist Federation. So those are the contradictions that I always grapple with uh, when I visit the Museum of Yugoslavia. Which I've done several times. Like there's, there's, there's definitely tensions there. The just reflections. I mean, brilliant presentations all along. Thank you all. Anna, would you like to answer? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I would like. I know that my presentation usually comes across as more uh, kind of. Um, 
affirmative uh, towards uh, Yugoslavia and Yugoslav anti-colonialism. That is definitely my standpoint, but also at the same time, I kind of want to make this nuanced uh, image of the work that has to be, that has to be, yes, yes to be done. Because I, I really think that a lot of self-reflection was not was not done at, at the time. This is something with, that we have to do today. Uh, and uh, the way I see it, uh, this kind of anti-colonial attitude and, and anti-coloniality, it is, it is really this kind of potentiality today. But we also should be very, very critical of, uh, of our historical selves in a way. We need to recuperate them or to rec recuperate ourselves in this regard because we, we are immersed in societies which are really, as I said, xenophobic and uh, nationalistic and, uh, uh, and patriarchal uh, uh, still. Uh, so I, I really, I really see those values as very important. But I, I think that criticism is crucial. And if I can just uh, uh, say something about Peters and uh, Zivka's uh, to connect some points uh, from from Zivka's uh, presentation, I, I very much like what you said about uh, this kind of zones of illegibility and zo zones of discord and being too much to unpack. And I was thinking about what makes them so ele illegible and. Uh, what would uh, those methodologies be to, to make this kind of research possible, to be nuanced enough not to be illegible anymore? And I would like to connect this to what, what Peter was saying, uh, that there is this kind of a genealogy of uh, language, of terminology. It is very important from where your methodologies are coming. Uh, uh, in, uh, even, even today, we, we can actually follow where, where certain notions came to our kind of uh, methodological toolkit and perhaps this is something that that you have in common perhaps we, we really need some kind of new methodology uh, in approach to this kind of illegible and and uh, and discord uh, monster uh, as Jivka said and uh, I also then wanted to connect with uh, what Demina was was talking about about translation that uh, uh, as if I understood correctly, there is there is, there is not only this way kind of we are producing and interpret, but we also have to bear in mind the way uh, uh, we are accepting certain knowledge. So it is always kind of twofold uh, twofold process. So this is just what I wanted to wrap up. Thank you so much. Yamina, would you like to add something to this or ask a question to anyone? Yeah, maybe maybe two things. But one is the um, one question that I grapple with is the way how we talk about race and racism, racialization in the Balkans uh, or in post Yugoslav spaces. And um, as I recently engaged with uh, Black Marxist thought and the um, and dialectical. Um, um, or, you know, methodologies that are kind of sort of um, focusing on the, the economics and the surge of capitalism and really talking about racial capitalism. I, um, I'm trying to find good uh, entries into the, the analysis of racial capitalism in, um, in the Balkans, because I don't think uh, the way it is being studied and portrayed in America necessarily can replicate, neither epistemologically or uh, methodologically, however, it can draw on it for sure. Um, so I think I'm curious about uh, potential collaborations about understanding the ways we are talking and uh, and cre creating nourishing discussions on on uh, racial orders in the Balkans. But given the recent engagement with uh, Charles Mill's racial contract, I do wonder whether we could debate on a racial contract of the Balkans that is that that happens or emerges in the confluence of. Uh, you know, racial contract that was uh, sort of established uh, five, six centuries ago and uh, instigated um, slave trade and, you know, colonization projects and neocolonialism, and then specificities that emerge from the, from the ways um, that racial politics um, unfolds in the Balkans, particularly in relation to uh, 
Roma and refugees who are specifically uh, visually different, um, uh, so representation of brown bodies. But on the other hand, as Mills argues, we also have racial orders of whites, those who are more white and who are less white. And then I think Pira was referring to Muslims, migrant workers. Uh, um, so uh, even, even if we wanna talk about the Second World War and the positionality of Jewish. Um, so I'm kind of curious, um, uh, whether there is um, there is a spark and enough of um, uh, I don't know willingness to maybe get into the collaborative projects where we can muse and ruminate and discuss more uh, critically about the the complexities of racial politics in the Balkans. I'm not sure if uh, there were, that was a question. Well, that was in a sense question, but I'm not sure if um, I formulated it. Well, that was a very strong proposition. Uh, and I think that, that this is very necessary and uh, I would be very much open for, you know, like working on that uh, with anyone who would be interested. So let's continue this discussion. That. Zivka, can, do you want to answer on this or like comment on anything? Pose any questions? You're muted. So many thoughts and and um, and questions, and I maybe want to echo Emina's and also Piero's very important, um, you know, discussion about race and racism in the Balkans and how important. And I know that there's been a lot of. Uh, work uh, lately that we're also looking forward to in in terms of that and I want to also think about the kind of the shifting racial regimes from the socialist to the post-socialist times right and how do we kind of register these tremendous shifts in the kind of the racialization and the the regimes of racial the, the racial regimes as as they were of course embedded in um in ethnicity in categories and in religion and and they intersect in very particular ways in the balkans and also you know our gender uh kind of um relations and kind of forms of patriarchy are also very uh, specific and and how that uh was uh configured under socialism and then how you know we have these kind of entirely different forms of racializations and racial subjects that emerge uh, in the post-socialist years that are like much more colonial in um, uh, and, and kind of adopt these colonial models of race. And, and so, um, yeah, so I was just kind of thinking about that as well. It would be an incredible project to kind of shift. And I think that of uh, trace that shift um, Oh, one of my colleagues, Ross and Jagalov's work is kind of um, um, uh, has been kind of thinking about this. So just to continue the conversation. Thank you, Zivka. And Piro, would you be up for like trying to give an answer to your own question? I think that's uh, <laughs> still open for debate, you know, like, uh, I, I mean, um, yes, uh, um, I also have a feeling that there is, a, especially from the left, this sometimes uncritical um, or not enough critical uh, view on, uh, on on this heritage. Uh, and uh, um, and I, I am interested, like honestly, like how to grapple with these uh, complexities. Uh, um, so do you, do you have any idea? I know that you have been also writing about these issues yourself, so. I mean, a lot of it, I, I, I've experienced a lot of betrayal because for instance, I, I was uh, very hopeful of Tsipras um, and Syriza when they took power in Greece, you know, their pre-electoral discourse was all about, we're going to open the borders. There will be no difference between us and refugees. Greece will become a host country. We will be the exception to the EU. And then two years into power, you know, all of that was reversed. And so, I mean, and I'm not to mention getting rid of Varoufakis, like I will leave the economics even behind it because there's that element as well. And similarly, like in Kosovo, like self-determination with Vendosia was this amazing uh, leftist decolonial alternative to everything else in the region. And just a couple of months ago, they signed an agreement with the Danish government to bring 
Danish prisoners, surplus prisoners, to serve their prison sentence in Kosovo. So, I mean, essentially, like exchanging bodies for uh, profits. So it's it's a there's there's like a there's now a tradition of leftist movements colliding and collaborating with the European Union because initially it's articulated as an excuse to say, well, there's no alternative. And then that moves beyond that just not being an alternative to kind of completely come in line with EU politics of borderization. And sadly, those issues never reach the the public discourse afterwards because they become irrelevant to the more client uh, relations between local politics and the EU. Uh, so, I mean, and of course, I, I say this about these two more recent movements because there's similar uh, cases around the Balkans. And I think where they stand on history, usually it's very telling of the kind of politics and policies that they will bring into place. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, it's a very depressing answer, but that's just, I mean, that's just the reality on the ground. And I, um, I, I hope it will change. I mean, there's small, uh, there's small movements uh, across the region that are emerging that are refusing to kind of do this, this client 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 uh, master relation with the EU. But I don't think they're big enough or powerful enough to kind of have any meaningful say in the larger political discourse. Thanks, Peter. Um, I wanted to bring maybe the conversation a little bit back to arts uh, because Peter was the the one, the only one who has kind of like persistently, uh, you know, like uh, had his uh, focus uh, on it. But I know that others also do the do, do work so, uh, work on art, and I I know that Jivka was, uh, you know, like also writing about the the the, the shortlist monuments uh, in uh, uh, in Bulgaria and what has been happening with this heritage. So maybe Jivka, you could share some of that uh, work with us. Absolutely, and and it's um, actually thank you for this question because this is precisely what I'm kind of um, currently working on, and I'm very happy to share. Uh, some of this with with you because I'm right now I'm in Plovdiv, Bulgaria, uh, and for a long time we've been trying to sort of um, restore this anti-fascist monument from the socialist times from the 1970s, and 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 I've been uh, writing about it and researching it, uh, which is incredibly powerful. It's like a, this a beautiful. Uh, sort of example of socialist modernism that's very syncretic and incredibly sort of uh, there's a, this um, beautiful symbiosis between the monumental arts and um, the architecture and public space and and sort of urban planning and and so uh, we have this marvelous example of the synthesis that the 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 monumental arts kind of achieved during the 70s uh, in 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 this modernist um, uh, uh, very beautiful modernist um, uh, um, um, rendition of of Bulgarian um, uh, revolutionary history and so and and since the nineteen you know since nineteen eighty nine this and was like closed down and then it was um, sort of um, um, some parts of it were taken um, by by the people because there were like these um, uh, years of, of crisis and 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 like you know uh, very uh, scarce resources and so um, some of the metal was taken and recycled and then now what we have left is kind of um, still possible to restore. Uh, and I started working on on this kind of possible project of restoring the monument because it's not only a monument to kind of anti-fascist history, but it's also there's it, it's it's a tomb. It's a um, um, it's a tomb. It's a um, it's a place of a resting place for um, the anti-fascist uh, fighters who uh, were killed in the Second World War between. 1941 and 43 and so 
Um, and so it's it's just kind of I've been moving more towards the um, kind of this material history and how do we restore and reactivate this material history in very in very real ways uh, as as a form of resistance and, and as a form of kind of reasserting anti-fascist history in the space because uh, right now the uh, the monument as well as all all of these other anti-fascist monuments in Bulgaria have been. Um, uh, really um, just abandoned and this memory is, you know, I mean, this is their memory. This is the memory. They, these, very often these are their resting places and, and so on. And it's like the state of these monuments is beyond um, just believable. Right. And so, um, uh, and so I'm just kind of saying that um, I started saying that as an example of what uh, kind of restless history means and how we can sort of um, um, activate the agency of this uh, of this history and the kind of the material uh, the material um, remains of it or the material remnants of it. Uh, well, it's still possible because um, yeah, it has a lot of power, has a lot of agency, and every time in the city, because the city right now is um, dominated by um, anti-communist um, and nationalist forces. Uh, and every time uh, we try to do something about it, and then there's just this like huge, humongous like um, drama in public space, and 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 then it's just like there's a lot of like very very strong feelings uh, that emerged from just from like by activating, but just by touching the issue, and and so it makes me think about this kind of incredible incredible power of the. Of, of an, an agency, political agency, uh, that, um, uh, that, that the socialist heritage um, holds um, uh, and, and contains um, and, 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 and its political potential uh, for um, a and, and which is for, for uh, you know, a, you know, anti-fascist politics, for example, which is especially um, especially pertinent and, and urgent right now when uh, we have, uh, we just had, uh, as many of you know, uh, Luke of March was um, this, you know, neo-fascist uh, march and, and, and in, in public, which has been happening in, in so many years now, continuously just happened like several days ago again even though it was banned in public. Mm, but the, uh, the fascists uh, just marched again um, on the streets of Sofia and so on. Thank you, Jacob, for sharing this. I'm again thinking about how, you know, these histories are contested in the local context and when would, you know, like this uh, socialist monument and heritage, you know, in which geographical spot of ex-Yugoslavia, in every spot it would work in a different way, I would say. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess that it would completely work, uh, you know, like folk, uh, politically in, uh, in Kosovo, uh, in Bosnia and in Slovenia, for instance. But yeah, in this, this has been a, a topic that uh, many have uh, uh, addressed, like in the, in the last, let's say, fifteen to twenty years, uh, in in, in post-Yugoslav context. Anna, would you like to uh, add something uh, to this about uh, art? Uh, well. Um... I would just say that uh, the example that I was talking about uh, is very specific and uh, the other place of my interest is also Museum of Yugoslavia and uh, uh, as much as I, as I find them really close to my heart and fascinating that also they also need to go through Taro, uh, let's say decolonial thinking and hopefully through this kind of nuanced thinking that is kind of very uh, specific because I really don't think there is one model fits all or, or one kind of thinking fits all. So uh, each and every institution and uh, going back to art institutions, uh, which was kind of a topic of this of this uh, uh, webinar, uh, each institution has a very kind of particular uh, work culture and language. And uh, this is something that, that was uh, kind of weaving through all of these presentations. We need to think about different kind of micro, meso and, and macro uh, levels of these nuances because there are always different kind of uh, 
influences intersecting in a particular institution. And it is very interesting after you're working in one institution for quite, quite some time, for example, several years, you can actually learn this kind of second language of uh, this kind of institutional thinking and behaving. And uh, every time you have this kind of matrix within one institution, there is also some kind of normalized knowledge going along with it. So I think there is so many levels that we need to th take into account. Uh, and uh, I'm going back to, to, to kind of normalizations in institutions. It goes also for museums, but it also goes for any kind of, let's say, monument, because also monumentalization is something that has been debated a lot uh, um, in previous years. And, um, uh, well, I don't know where I was going with this, but I think, uh, in a way, I want to say that we really need to think of specific uh, cases and specific histories and uh, in a way not not uh, generalize things uh, and only this way we can actually uh, bring about something which is emancipatory otherwise we will be just doing the same thing as uh, as i think was done with for example the museum of african art or even museum of uh, yugoslavia which has even more layered history and that is kind of repeating the same models over and over again so i don't know if this is kind of <laughs> relating to what jivka was saying We have also some comments in the chat um, that I might just read out loud now. Uh, I don't know where to start from, maybe from this. Um, so uh, it's a comment by uh, Sanaz Raji, if I uh, am spelling it correctly. Uh, uh, very honored to have had the chance to watch, listen to this excellent panel discussion. I suppose this is a question posed to Emina, Piero, and Jivka. As an Iranian double migrant, I've always interested, uh, I was always interested, I'm always interested in understanding if there are links drawn and reflected upon from activists on the ground, whether in Bosnia, Serbia, Bulgaria, and so on, uh, between ongoing US backed sanctions on Iran that began at the start of the revolution in 1978, specifically how the sanctions have been a colonial tool that has continued to disempower and marginalize poor working class and racialized Iranians who have been part of this migrant seeking to enter the EU. I ask this question because within the Anglo-American left and those involved with border abolition work in both countries, there is an utter lack of nuance on how US sanctions have shaped a continued brain drain within Iran uh, when talking about recent Iranian migration um, to the West. So, uh, Piro, Amina, Zivka, do you want to answer this question? Amina? Um, I have attempted to provide a brief response um, in the chat too, and I said that um, we live in oblivion often and are not aware of the US imposed sanctions on, um, on Iran. Um, and so I think there is uh, this really engaged and active community that is trying to uh, draw our attention to um, to the fact that the long lasting sanctions are a form of killing people in Iran. And uh, it is really not only the matter of forced migration, but it's really on affecting domestic lives of people who are not able or willing to migrate. Um, and so we have been collaborating. Uh, when I say we, I'm thinking about imagining transnational solidarities research circle. I'm talking about the collective agitate, uh, an open access journal that unsettles disciplinary boundaries. Um, and traditional knowledges. I'm also talking, uh, talking about locally shaped uh, women's circle um, uh, collective that was shaped in spring of 2020 in my hometown of CSAC um, or 2021 when we joined the uh, no, san no sanctions on Iran global campaign um, because we do also have uh, Iranian refugees and migrants living living in CSAC and wanting to draw attention to what is going on, um, and it, this is not this is not not supposed to be perceived as an Iranian issue only, but it is uh, it is a, a rather. Um, uh, more of a, it requires more of a transnational transnational response. So um, I'm also I also do not want to say with this that by paying attention to protest actions that we are doing enough, 
but this is what we have been what we have been working on uh, bringing attention to the issue and talking about the layers of those sanctions which are not only economic but are but are uh, affecting lives in our community there are iranians and iranian americans whose family who are losing members of their families due to sanctions so uh for many for many people in this in this campaign or in this movement this is a very very personal issue and it's not it's not that it's not only so um uh, an issue or an action that emerges in solidarity with others it is really the one that affects people individually Theodore Stevkin. I mean, I can only add what Emina said, an historical uh, peculiarity, which is that when uh, the Iranian revolution happened in 1979, there was, uh, Yugoslavia also uh, declared sanctions against Iran, even though it needed Iranian oil desperately, it still had to uh, follow by and large the Western world in sanctions to Iran. And there was a small group of uh, Bosnians in Sarajevo who in their own ways protested these sanctions. And chief among them was a woman called Melika Bosnawi Salibegovic, uh, for whom I've made a short documentary film about, but she, along with other comrades, practically uh, protested the Yugoslav sanctions against Iran. Eventually, she gets thrown in prison in Yugoslavia. And when she comes out of jail in 1984 or five, I believe, uh, because she was also charged with the group of the Sarajevo process, Sarajevsky process, I don't know how familiar you are with that, but it's essentially about 13 Muslim activists who gets um, punished in Yugoslav courts for pan-Islamist politics, and she was one of them. And when she gets out of prison, she, of course, forges a passport and moves to Iran because she believes that, well, OK, the revolution has happened there. Like, it must be everything that we imagined it would be. And after six months there, she essentially gets uh, uh, labeled as a Yugoslav spy. So she gets deported from Iran, too. So it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a very... A specific story, but it's also a story that speaks about the kind of second and third world political relations um, that were at times, like I said earlier, concurrent with larger geopolitics, geopolitical alignments, and at times there were these misalignments within them as well. So that was just some, I mean, it, it wasn't a it wasn't necessarily a very big movement, but there was a movement. And similarly, Yugoslavia used its Muslim population to negotiate uh, relations with the Muslim world frequently. I mean, Bulgaria did this as well, especially in North Africa, in Libya, um, but also in the Middle East, in Syria and Iraq, uh, with development projects, which generally meant construction construction of schools, construction of hospitals, usually exchange of medical staff and so forth. Really interesting. And thank you, Piro, for um, sort of um, thinking and also Emina for beginning to the kind of uh, um, making these connections and um, leading us into ways of, of thinking about this very um, interesting and difficult question that Sanas uh, is is uh, posing about Iranian uh, the Iranian relationships between the socialist countries and you know what was happening post and pre you know pre Iranian revolution and and so and also and I'm kind of thinking about this from the uh, from the Bulgarian history which is very different from Yugoslav history and I'm thinking that how in um, the, even though it was like what Piro was saying about the 
kind of um, forging these uh, uh, connections between uh, the the countries in the Muslim countries in the global south and um, in in North Africa in particular, right? Bulgaria had um, a lot of kind of exchange um, programs, uh, professional programs and other programs with um, uh, Muslim countries from uh, uh, North Africa in particular, and but also in the Middle East. And so, um, and so even with that, also within the country, uh, like I, I don't think that like in the 1970s, like there was there was beginning to kind of uh, emerge this very anti-Muslim regime in Bulgarian um, socialist uh, history, uh, anti-Turkish, um, anti-Muslim. Uh, there was a lot of um, you know it culminated in the so-called revival process, and and so. Um, uh, and and also in the kind of um, expulsion of um, like a lot of Muslim people in Bulgaria, uh, mostly of Turkish descent and, and Turkish identity, and so um, and so I'm not sure how to kind of think about. I I don't think that the Bulgarian uh, state or the Bulgarian socialist government was very friendly towards the uh, you know especially post uh, revolutionary. Iran and the kind of and the situation um, um, there and what what and and also the refugees um, the refugees from if it if it hosted any refugees from Iran after the revolution um, so um, it's a very interesting question thank you Sanas for further research <laughs> thank you all for for your um comments uh it is 10 minutes to nine uh if there are no like further questions or comments from the audience uh, i think this is a good moment to kind of uh, close it for the the general public and stop the recording and you know like continue this conversation in a bit more informal atmosphere and start planning uh, what we want to do in the future Thank you all. It was a really amazing event. <laughs>